We begin with cricket on this Wednesday edition of the Sportsmag Zone. A very similar story to day one of the first test. The West Indies were made to toil in the field for the first two sessions before fighting back in the final session on day one of the second and final test against South Africa at Wanderers in Johannesburg. The Windies made one change to their bowling attack, swapping Shannon Gabriel with left-arm spinner Gurukesh Moti, but it did not stop the South African top order from scoring heavily. The hosts ended day one and 311 for seven after winning the toss and batting. Aidan Markram again led with an assault on the Windies bowlers, falling four short of a century with 96. Tony De Zorzi was also in the runs, contributing 85. Motis' inclusion proved fruitful for the Windies. The Guyanese have so far taken three for 75, while Carl Mears has two for 24. Mears spoke to the media after the day's play. Obviously, it's the first session of the, of the game, uh, we searching to find out what was the best length, what was the best lane to, to bowl on the deck. After bowling a few overs, then realizing then what is best, you know, um, just trying to starve the batsmen. Obviously, they got ahead with the run rate, and we just wanted to bring it down a bit. We thought that bringing down the run rate would have created more chances, and, and we did that. I think it's always an open game. Um, 300 on the board in the first innings is always good for a buying team, especially in these conditions with the ball moving around. Um, it's just for us now to limit them as, as least as possible, you know, bring them to under 400, you know, to keep the game open. Um, we thought they bought it really well at the beginning. As you said, um, the late strikes this evening, you know, brought us back into the game. Joining us to review the day's play is international cricket commentator Fazir Mohammed. Faz, Welcome again. Good to be on the show, Good yeah. to be on the show once more. <laughs> Great to have you once more. Well, Faz, 206 for one after the second session in the opening test at Centurion. 247 for two at the end of two sessions in this second test at the Wanderers. Is it that the West Indies did not learn their lesson from the first test? How do you assess it? Well, it's obvious the West Indies didn't learn the lesson. And, and I, think, I think what was more disappointing about it, Ricardo, is the defensive posture that, that seemed to be almost automatic. I mean, when you have a situation very early on where you, you've got bowlers with a new, relatively new ball, with a cover on the boundary, with a backward point on the boundary, when you have a spinner who comes on, and yes, he's expensive for a couple of overs, but you've got almost immediately you've got a long off in place, a long off, a deep cover, a deep mid wicket. What is this? One day international cricket? So, so, and that was the, the really disappointing element of it. Of course, the, the, the bowling was expensive, and yes, I listened to what Kyle Mills just said there, but you don't need four hours to work out how to tighten things up. If you're test match cricketers, you probably need half an hour. If you're a great cricketer, you probably need one over. So, so, so really, it, 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 the disappointing element was one, the repetitiveness of it, but it was even worse than the first day at Centurion because I just could not understand the defensive posture. I mean, Jason Holder coming on to bowl is usually very economical, and you start with a cover on the boundary. It just didn't make sense. Yeah, Carl Mears, uh, as we look at the scoreboard, they're 311 for 7 at the end of the day. Moti 3 for 75, Mears 2 for 24, the pick of the bowlers. Markram getting that 96. I've been looking at this since the Zimbabwe series, and of course it had been done before that with some amount of success. So I must admit that I am not... I haven't necessarily made up my mind as to how I feel about this, but I wanted to get your impression on us continuing to use Carl Mears as the first change? I think it's a good, a good option, uh, not just because of the success that he had against England, which was so famous, those five wickets that he took uh, to, uh, to lead the West Indies to victory uh, in the deciding third and final test match in Grenada almost a year ago, but because of his skills. I think more than anybody else, he moves the ball around, not a great pace, but it does with the fact that he doesn't have that great pace, that it wobbles about. And I, I think it's a good option uh, because we've seen that prove quite successful on many an occasion. Uh, but when it doesn't work, you, you've got to go to your other options. So I don't see it as a, as a bad idea at all. Sometimes it's not just about the pace, it's about the ability with that lack of pace 
to move the ball around, and we saw that success in the final session today. Right, and Faz, of course, Gurukesh Moti, 3 for 75, West Indies moved to bring in the spinner. What did you make of their use of Craig Brathwaite's use of Gurukesh Moti? Well, as we alluded to yesterday in the, in the description, the mere fact that South Africa had included two specialist spinners in their lineup suggested that they felt that this would be a track that, that would turn. And we saw that from virtually the first session. Granted, the first couple of wickets taken by Moti weren't really excellent deliveries. One was down the leg side and Elgar patted its way to be taken at short pine leg. The other one, Markram, looking to play the reverse sweep on 96 and good anticipation by the first slip, Jermaine Black. With, but he also got the wicket of the Zonzi uh, on 85 with an excellent delivery. So yes, credit to him. He's coming off a, a test match in Bulawayo where he picked up 13 wickets, missed out on the second with this back strain or whatever it was. Now he's back in the team. And, and, and clearly the confidence would have been gleaned from that. Uh, again, he was wayward also. But, but, but again, it's, the, 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 the attitude seems to be defense first and then we'll attack. And, and I don't think that's the right posture because I think especially on the first day of a test match, yes, the conditions might be ideal for batting, but you've got to back your bowlers. You've got to believe that they've got an opportunity if they bowl properly, and that, that was also a concern, quite, quite obviously, about bowling properly and backing them with attacking fields, not just Moti, but all the other bowlers. Yeah, and speaking about backing the bowlers, what did you make your assessment of the fielding? Because there were a couple of opportunities. I felt, you know, we had to get early wickets, and we missed out on that based on poor fielding. Well, well, sharpness in the field has been a constant bugbear uh, for the West Indies. Uh, and, and that's why it's, it's, it's something that, that you, you ask yourself, you know, when, when we have these discussions, these analyses, we find ourselves virtually bringing up the same things yeah. every time. And errors in the field, sloppiness in the field, defensive field postures, allowing batsmen to get away to start when they should be put under pressure. These are the things that, that you wouldn't say that you need to have world-class pass bowlers and batsmen to make you a competitive team in these particular situations. What you need is that sense of that understanding of what is required. And, and, and again, this is a point that's been made over and over again. You might be struggling for quality batsmen or quality bowlers, but surely you can do the work to be excellent in the field. No one is ever completely flawless. That, that, that happens nowhere in the world in any endeavor. But surely you can eliminate errors by being tighter in the field, by being sharper in the field, by building pressure on batsmen. Yeah, Faz, I want to magnify the point that you're making about the West Indies bowling performance, not putting any pressure at all on the, or not putting enough pressure on the South African batsmen, and specifically to Markram dismissal, um, that reverse scoop shot that he attempted four short of 100, um, suggests to me that he was so confident um, that that was a shot played to me in this day and usually batsmen in their 90s would become careful to ensure that they get 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 three figures correct uh, and again you, you got that sense from markram a hundred and a forty odd in the second innings of the first test man of the match bringing with confidence watching the field spread to all parts as soon as he gets on strike yeah. it's almost like saying well am i big richards okay fine no problem i'm going to do everything possible and yes he, he he fell into his own trap with that overconfidence is that reason to continue with that policy i hope not because, because surely it's about bowling one side of the wicket if you're not that not, not, not much is happening you it's fundamental lance you know it's i mean Whatever format of the game, at any level, it's about learning to bowl one side of the wicket, bowl to your field, set, 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 try to build some pressure, rather than creating an environment where the batsmen are so confident that the overconfidence caused Mark from this wicket at 96. Your thoughts quickly on Azar is bowling today. He... he it wasn't as economical as we had seen him in the first test and didn't particularly have a good day today, even though we have accepted that he is um, improving and his performance in recent months is giving us hope that he is developing his craft. 
I suppose the argument could be that he's been so good for 12 months that he's allowed an off day. But this is high level sport and it has to be pointed out that his length was too full, uh, like, like so many of the other bowlers, too many deliveries that, that offered the batsman opportunities to capitalize. Let's hope that he tightens up going into day two and the West Indies can really limit South Africa from going beyond 350, getting closer to 400. Because even if the pitch seems much better for batting, notwithstanding the assistance for the spinners, than at Centurion, uh, as far as pace and bounce and seam movement, runs on the board or runs on the board. And the West Indies batting, as we know, whether in these conditions or almost any other conditions, would be notoriously fragile. So far, Zari, look, look, uh, uh, given the fact that he's acknowledged that he, he, he's learning from others and picking up pointers from others, he would well, hopefully have learned from this being one of his off days and really focus on getting the job done if he's required going into that second morning. But yes, he, he was off color today. Yeah, we heard at the start of the first test that the pitch at Centurion was likely to quicken up uh, as it went on and indeed it did we saw the pace we saw the bounce and we saw the West Indies batsmen wilt under that we're now hearing that this surface at the Wanderers is expected to actually slow down um, yes likely to deteriorate as well do you think that the West Indies would prefer the conditions forecast for this surface than they would have enjoyed the conditions um, at Centurion? I think they will because, again, it brings us back to the state of our Caribbean cricket where most of our players, the vast majority of our players, are brought up on pitches that are slow and low. The, the, the element of tilt will be a concern because uh, you can expect Simon Hama and Kishab Maraj. Maraj and Hama both missed out on the first test match. Um, Maraj's omission was a big surprise and he'll have a point to prove. So that is going to be a challenge for the West Indies. Just remember, he took a hat trick against the West Indies in St. Lucia in, 20, in 2021 uh, when, the, when the West Indies uh, succumbed in both test matches. But yes, the West Indies should, should be a little more comfortable in conditions that they are more familiar with. But that takes nothing away from the challenge that will be presented by Kadiso Rabada and company. Yes, they are missing Amit Noke. We talked about that yesterday and uh, uh, Marco Janssen and so, and so on. But the, the fact of the matter is that if South Africa are more disciplined in their bowling and have concerted pressure then that could be the downfall of the West Indies. But, but indeed, as far as the, the surface, I, I, I think the West Indies will be more comfortable with this type of surface. Yeah, Faz, day one, out the way. Thank you very much for joining us again. We'll chat again tomorrow after day number two. Thank you. Yeah. Mariah Lance, you know, I listened to Sean Pollock, the former South African great, speak about the first two session performance from the West Indies. And he said in his playing time, he saw many visiting teams come to South Africa and they would try so hard that they would lose their line and length and essentially the, the, the South African team would get away. And he said what he found in a lot of the South African pitches that all you needed to do was to put the ball in the right areas consistently, starve the batsmen of runs and eventually the wickets would come. And I feel as if the West Indies felt prey to that in the first two sessions, trying too hard, trying to do too much, instead of just finding a good line, finding a good length, and then allowing the wickets to come. Mm. Well, that's a narrative that I've heard before from you know successive coaches at different levels. And Sean Pollock, not currently a coach, he's commentating, but he understands the game and had a a uh, largely successful campaign and career as an international cricketer and the coaches would have told him that so um, I understand that the West Indies feel that they have to work really hard here to get a result in this game so if, if, you, if you're guilty of trying too hard I guess you don't want to quarrel but yeah. <laughs> the fact they don't what, try at all yeah, they, yeah. they didn't try yeah so I, I understand the point here but what Ricardo said is correct. In, in, in the bowling business, you've got to be consistent. You've got to hit the right spots. And, and invariably, batsmen will make errors. Yes. It's, not, it's not every day that you're going to hit on, onto a pitch <laughs> and you're going to force the batsmen into errors. Because yeah. uh, the, 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 the batsmen folks out Africa at the moment are, re are really confident. They won the first test. Markram, who got 100, was just um, appointed T20 captain, so his stocks has, 
as have risen now as a as an international cricketer. So I, I agree with you, Ricardo, that they needed to be more consistent and patient. Yeah. I think yeah. that's the word. Yeah. 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 I was just a little bit disappointed, as Faz pointed out, because we saw it in the opening test where they were able to get a number of wickets in the final session, but they were not patient enough in the first two sessions. So they allowed the South Africans to get away. And the fact that it was worse this time around is a that's massive disappointment. Yeah, 247 runs in the first two sessions. Mm. No, I don't think good enough. That's it for a cricket segment today. We'll be watching day number two and talking about it tomorrow as well. Stay with us. More to come on the Sports Max Zone. Trinidad and Tobago, the Soka Warriors, they arrived in Kingston today. We'll be talking about them after this. Stay with Sportsmax on YouTube and follow us on all social pages for updates, news and entertainment. <laughs>